Welcome back. Recovery efforts are underway in California after two earthquakes hit the state last week. The July 4th and 5th events caused serious damage. Luckily, no deaths or injuries have been reported, but the insurance payments are estimated at less than $1 billion. Now, we are learning some residents may be seeing their premium spike, and that's if they purchased protection against earthquakes in the first place. That's because premiums are being adjusted to reflect what's become a shifting seismic risk. A forecast done in 2014 is being implemented this year to determine the insurance rates. That might seem dated, but it's replacing data used since 2007. CBS News reports it was bound to happen with or without last week's events. To discuss this, let's bring in John Rundle. He's a distinguished professor of physics, earth, and planetary science at UC Davis. And Glenn Pomeroy joins us from Sacramento, California. He's the CEO of the California Earthquake Authority, which is a nonprofit offering residential earthquake insurance to people there in the state. Gentlemen, welcome to you both. Uh, John, I want to first begin with you because the data being used from this forecast says, uh, quote, the likelihood of moderate size earthquakes is lower, whereas that of larger events is higher in the state of California. And this is compared from the last time the survey was done back in 2007. So what other differences are we seeing here between the two fresh data sets? Well, it's a difference in methodology. The earlier study used um, a great deal of expert opinion. That is to say, people like myself going to meetings and giving advice to the uh, people who are constructing the survey uh, whereas the latter survey that the USGS and others have used is based upon uh, some fairly large computer uh, models and simulations. Now, it's important to note that there are a great many uh, parameters, uh, numbers that have to be assumed um, or measured in some way uh, in the uh, both studies. In fact, thousands of them, uh, tens of thousands. And because of that, some of those numbers change. They change because new data uh, has been discovered. And they also change because people have looked at the old data and put them into a new context. And, and based on the newest information, what areas are at the highest risk of being hit with an earthquake? Is it still what we already know, areas close to fault lines? Or is there something new here? Well, so in these studies, basically, they assume uh, that most of the earthquakes will occur on the existing fault lines, the most active ones, such as the San Andreas Fault, and in Southern California, the San Jacinto and Elsinore Faults. One area that's particularly um, uh, possible for a major earthquake is the southern southernmost section of the San Andreas Fault which hasn't broken in hundreds of years. All right, let me bring in Glenn here, because, Glenn, you're with the, the uh, nonprofit that offers residential earthquake insurance. The data we've just been speaking about is from about five years ago. So how do you incorporate it and how as you des determine insurance rates for people? Yeah, we use the work of John and his colleagues, the scientific community. We're required by law, in fact, to use the best available science when we set our rates. And our rates are set just to cover the risk. We're a not-for-profit organization, as you said, so we don't add in a profit load. We just collect enough in premium so that we know we'll be able to pay the claims of our policyholders using best available science and having rates that are actuarially sound. And CBS News found that the average quake premium in California is about $800 per year. but. Glenn, put that into context for us. Do you expect for folks to see that rate go up? Is the risk increasing inevitably as we look at um, recent trends? And, and what factors determine that? You know, we learn something all the time. Um, yeah, we, we learn things all the time. When earthquakes happen, there's, there's an advance of knowledge that occurs again. I was down in Ridgecrest this weekend and driving through the Mojave Desert. You could see the geologists and the seismologists out there in the hot desert sun taking uh, readings and, and, uh, and, and instrument uh, uh, tests. Uh, the learning from the, the vaults that had just occurred. What, what, what transpires then is the scientific community um, over time develops a new body of knowledge. And, and it doesn't happen overnight, and it doesn't, it doesn't react in any knee-jerk fashion. Uh, and so there will come a point in time where there, where there will be another major study released that will be digested by us. I believe that this 
um, event we've had this past week or so will not terribly impact uh, rates, hmm. um, but there may be other factors as science continues to evolve. Greater knowledge about how one fault can trigger another and so on. Right. Uh, it, new science evolves all the time and we need to keep on top of it. And so John, considering that, can you put those quakes from last week into context for us? Is it just a part of average life in California or in any way, shape or form, does it signal an uptick in activity? So we know that earthquakes are clustered in space and time. So unfortunately, you can expect an increase probably of activity throughout the state for a while. Um, how long that goes on is a matter of debate at this point. This is the first magnitude seven earthquake since the October 16th, 1999 Hector Mine earthquake that occurred in the Mojave Desert to the south. Um, one thing we know about the run-up to the 1906 earthquake, because people were living in California at that time and writing about it, is that we have an increasing number, uh, a more rapid rate of uh, occurrence of magnitude 6 earthquakes as the 1906 date approached. Um, so one of the problems that we see or we, we worry about in, in our field is when you have these kind of earthquakes that occur, is this something, uh, is this activity actually uh, portend something uh, even more um, destructive and damaging near population centers, basically surrounding the LA metropolitan area. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty worrisome. And considering that, Glenn, your nonprofit insures about 10% of homeowners in California. Do you feel that the premiums may in fact increase, may spike, which would result in, in some folks who need it refusing to purchase it? Well, uh, it's way too early to tell whether or not we'll, we'll see a, um, any sort of need to adjust premiums as a result of this event. Um, uh, we, we have, since the CA was formed after Northridge, uh, we've been around now for 20 some years, and we've been able to lower our, lower our rates by about 50% from the, the soaring premiums that were occurring after Northridge. So we, we've got earthquake insurance now to the point where it's affordable. If we have to make adjustments over time, I, I think people will realize it, it's because uh, there's even a greater understanding of the risk. So uh, our, our task is to do everything we can to get more people insured and hang on to those we have and then try to get more people insured because 90% uninsured rate in the state of California with two-thirds of the nation's earthquake risk is a recipe for disaster. Right, and there's one thing you can guarantee, be guaranteed of if you live in California is that an earthquake will happen at some point in the future, so get the insurance. John Rundle and Glenn Pomeroy, thank you for your time today. My pleasure. Thank you.